Hi, Krista. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm so glad that a fellow Canadian will be on the show, a fellow intuitive eater, an anti-diet advocate. And I'm so excited to have this conversation because you are in here from Manitona, Manitoba, I believe, Manitoba, Canada, and I am from Quebec, Canada. And when the forces unite and we have voices that are loud enough to really make a change, then we actually do start to see the change. And so welcome to the show, Krista. So excited to have you here. I'm so happy to be here. All right, so before we get into it, because there's a lot of hum and buzz around the word anti-diet and around the word intuitive eating, and before we deep dive into that, maybe you can just share with us your story as to why you decided to help your clients in this way, in a non-diet or non-conventional approach, especially with a background as a dietitian yourself. For sure. So when I was applying to university, actually, I um, was kind of debating between social work and nutrition because I just knew I wanted to help people. That was the one thing I knew. Um, And then nutrition ended up becoming a no brainer to me because at that time I was very much a dieter myself. And for me, I was passionate about nutritious nutrition, but passionate probably in the wrong way, more so passionate about eating foods to shrink my body. Um, that was my main goal. And I thought that would also make me healthier as that's kind of what the world tells you as well. If you're thinner, you're healthier. So that's kind of the reason I went into nutrition in the first place. Then during my degree, um, I struggled with like a lot of disordered eating and dieting throughout my life like I guess probably as young as age 13 Um, however at the time I never realized it was a struggle I thought my behaviors were healthy but once I was in university um, another nutrition student actually introduced me to the concept of intuitive eating so intuitive eating wasn't something that was really necessarily taught in school Um, our schooling is still fairly Mm -hmm. weight-centered so my friend who is also nutrition was the one who introduced it to me and I feel like I adopted it fairly easily because I was just so sick of um, the dieting ways, how much they affected my life. So I moved over to that and I graduated with an intuitive eating lens. I started out as a clinical dietitian, but then I very soon realized like that was not where my passion lied at all. I wanted to help people overcome what I overcame myself and which was dieting and disordered eating. So I became a certified intuitive eating counselor and I started my business dietitian Krista to do that. Oh, I love this. I love this. And so many things that you said here that I just want to deep dive in for sure. into for just a moment. And the first thing is about this need to shrink the body and how there's this pressure from society or outside forces. And oftentimes we're told by doctors or people that we look up to that in order for us to be healthy, we have to release weight. And so this is the general understanding of why it's so important to have a normal quote unquote BMI, whatever that means. And so let, let's just rewind to that moment in your life. And Just curious as to why you had the need to shrink yourself and to really control your food in order to achieve that. For sure. And so people, I guess that you can't see me being a podcast. um, I'm not in a larger body. I've never been in a larger body. I've always been fairly straight sized body. Um, But in like, you know, when I hit puberty in the seventh, eighth grade, I developed a little bit of lower belly fat. Right. And I think there was just always so many societal pressures to be thin. And I wouldn't say that I had pressures like that from my parents or you know, siblings or anything like that. But I think just in general, like I had another friend at the time who actually started struggling with more severe uh, disordered eating. And she was a lot thinner than me. And she was very self-conscious about her body constantly trying to change it. And I think I just started getting those messages, right? Social media wasn't even that big at the time, but even just watching people on YouTube, seeing people on TV, the people who are loved and uh, successful and all those things, right? They're always in thinner bodies. So it paints this picture that that is how we should look. Um, and also in healthcare too, right? If you go to a doctor, I actually remember my my sister who is a similar body size to me and she went to a doctor and the, do- the doctor calculated her BMI and told her you're overweight. And, uh-huh. you know, it's just those things, they feel pressure and then you feel there, there's something wrong with you. Like you need to change your body. You shouldn't have any visible body fat because that's seen as being bad. Mm. Right, right. And it's so interesting. I love that you said that because there is this massive association with I'm skinny and I'm happy, right? If Mm -hmm. if you're skinny, then you have joy in your life. If you're skinny, then you're successful. If you're skinny, you're going to be in a relationship. If you're skinny, you're going to get the job. And so there's this massive misconception and we are misguided in general, especially when we have people such as doctors who are sort of in the hierarchy of the information that we tend to listen to or believe or validate in general. 
and they're saying this to us and now we are maybe in an environment such as a social environment friends are now super fixated on what they eat and trying to lose weight and it's always about body image and body shaming and then even hearing some of our friends making comments about other people too and and i'm going to tell you this chris i remember this was maybe 10 15 years ago I, i was spending time in the social environment and some of the girls that i was spending time with which by the way i decided to not keep as friends due to some of the conversations that we would have but a lot of the the conversations were always about looking at other girls and just pointing out what's wrong with their bodies well she shouldn't be wearing that why i can't believe she's wearing that right or Mm -hmm. oh my god did you see that she put on weight oh did she lose weight and everything was always about body and i would start to notice that whenever we would meet or encounter a new person and they would enter our social group the first question was always about their weight it was never about what successful thing they did in their life what amazing achievement they did but it was more like congratulating someone because you noticed they lost weight not because they launched a podcast or not because they got a new job or not because they just got married or whatever it is or had a kid mm-hmm. everything was always focused around congratulations you lost weight and so this concept of needing constantly to lose weight i think is very ingrained in our the way that we behave in general in society yeah and i think like the other thing with that too is as people are losing weight too they they get those compliments all the right. time right so they think okay i'm smaller now people are noticing they're finding me more attractive this is good right so as soon as a person starts gaining weight again they feel really bad about themselves they're not getting those compliments anymore and i notice that all the time and like the other side of that too is when people are giving all these comp comments on bodies good or bad um like they they never know what they're complimenting, right? Like you could be complimenting so many things. It could be an eating disorder. It could be cancer. It could be severe stress. It could be grief. You never know. And then there's the other side of that. Well, you know, I know this person's been trying to lose weight. I know that they would appreciate this compliment and it's true. They probably would. But again, how are they going to feel when they gain their weight back or how are they feel about their past body now? Right. They clearly weren't good enough to you then. Oh, so good. I love everything you said. And such a great point is we have absolutely no idea ever what is going on on the inside. And we could maybe bump into somebody and make a comment about how amazing they look. And I think all of us have encountered somebody who is ill from cancer and just noticing their drastic weight loss. And so weight loss is not always associated with health. It's actually associated with sickness as well. And anybody who's going through cancer treatment, releasing a lot of weight, losing a lot of weight, would I know do anything to put weight back on and to have full health and vitality, even when that means more numbers on the scale. And so thanks for bringing that up because this is such an important important part to really bring home. And along those lines, you also mentioned that after having been in that dieting phase, restricting, really I, I would imagine making a lot of rules around food, what's good, what's bad, and if you're good or bad, and associating really almost your self-worth and your value with the things that you're eating, you mentioned earlier that it brought you to a disordered way of eating. Would you be able mm-hmm. to expand a little bit on that? For sure. Yeah. So I feel like I went through different cycles of what disordered eating looked like for me. Um, When I was younger and really had no knowledge to me, it was like eat as little as possible and eat nothing quote unquote bad. So it was like, you know, plain rice, but no butter or salt, like no sweets at all. Then also trying to like cut carbs. I went through a period of trying to eat minimal carbs. Um, Obviously the periods of like the more severe restriction when I was just trying to like avoid my hunger at all costs backfired all the time like every Mm -hmm. single weekend it led to like a rebound binge where i'd eat so much i'd feel sick um and then i felt like i had got myself more under control which for me was like counting my calories and eating you know a lower amount than i should have i was able to maintain it longer than other diets but it took away a lot of things in my life right like i couldn't then i couldn't go for you know dinner invites especially last minute right it had to fit into my plan or i couldn't go for ice cream dates i couldn't go out for a couple drinks with friends like i couldn't do so many things because of my diet and then including my exercise right when i was dieting and eating those ways i was also trying to do extreme amounts of exercise like going to the gym daily like hard hit workouts daily and sometimes even adding in a second run in the evening so i didn't have time for other things because i was so fixated on like how can i always be like moving my body or eating less and not thinking about food oh wow wow that that sounds to me so so restrictive i just feel that there there is this cage almost like we've made a self 
self-made prison essentially and we're putting ourselves in it because who are we doing this for i'm just super curious as you were doing this because i actually have a very similar story to you but as you're doing this and everything now is revolving around your body and what you're eating what you're not eating and how much you're moving and how much you're exercising and how many calories you're burning and so on and so forth and even overly analyzing which social events you're going to be at i'm just curious who are you doing this for Right. And I think at the time I thought like I'm doing it for me, but obviously you're kind of doing it to fit into this unrealistic standard of what society expects of you. So I thought it was for myself, but really it wasn't. I was, I was getting in the way of living just to try and lose a tiny bit of belly fat. <laughs> right. 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 Wow. So, so powerful. I just want to sit in this a moment because I feel that many of us can listen to this today and really learn and just even ask ourselves, just turn that question inwards and asking ourselves, who am I doing this for, right? Because if I'm doing this for me, it means I love myself and means that all of my acts should be loving and should feel good. But bringing myself to hunger where I'm not allowing myself to eat something doesn't feel good. Or turning down parties because there's going to be sweets there doesn't feel good. And then shaming myself for what I ate also doesn't feel good. And so how can that be that we're doing all this for ourselves? Exactly. You're engaging in so many behaviors that actually aren't honoring your health or your self-care at all. And that's kind of the way I like to focus on things because people think, oh, but when I diet, I feel better, you know, and it's like, well, dieting doesn't necessarily own these behaviors that make us feel good. It doesn't own these healthy behaviors. We can be engaging in healthy behaviors that feel good to our body without making it into a diet, diet, right? Because if you're engaging in dieting behaviors, chances are they're poorly impacting your emotional and your mental health. So we have to think of health as a big picture, right? It's not all about the physical and also diets aren't good for your physical health either. <laughs> 100%. Oh, so good. I love that so much, so much. And, and I think I'm curious also, Krista, where you kind of stand in that balance between being a dietitian and then being also an intuitive eater or an intuitive nutritionist. And so where is that balance? Because when we study things in school, and I also studied a lot of nutrition in school, and a lot of it was calories and just really understanding how many calories are in carbs and how many calories are in proteins and so on and so forth and nutrients and how we should and should not be eating. And so there's all these rules. And then all of a sudden also there, I mean, before we even move on to the intuitive eating part, there is actually a lot of value in understanding some of that stuff because I actually truly believe that we don't know what we don't know. And when we are marketed certain foods in our society as being good for us or being healthy because that's actually a sales pitch for us, I think that we own the responsibility to know whether or not something does serve us or not, especially when we have this rise in cancer and all of these other metabolic diseases. So there's, there's this part of the spectrum that I acknowledge and I verify and I absolutely believe exists and is important and has its place. And then there's this other part where we're now focusing on hyper restricting and then body shaming and then really even overriding the natural cues of the body where the body is now asking to eat or feels satisfied and is feeling full and no longer requires food. And so how do you separate the two or is there this beautiful marriage between the two and you're able to actually sort of ping pong back and forth with this information? For sure, for sure. So uh, nutrition is still a big part of intuitive eating, right? The 10th principle of intuitive eating is honor your health with gentle nutrition. So nutrition is still a big component of it. And I think that's where people like don't understand is there's this common misconception of intuitive eating, just eat whatever you want, whenever you want. Or, you know, if you're not a dieter, you're an intuitive eater where there's three phases, right? You could be a dieter, you could be a non-dieter, you could be an intuitive eater. So intuitive eating, um, yes, we understand certain foods. Um, if you eat them all the time, they may like, we know fruits and vegetables are helpful in cancer prevention, for example. We know like high amounts of saturated fat can lead to high cholesterol, things like that. We know these things, but when you start to get into the restrictive behaviors it's it basically sets you up to want these foods more and more and more yes. um so there's a there's a balance right we can eat a variety of all these foods and if you're eating intuitively you're eating in ways that honor your health you're eating in ways that make you feel good you're eating in ways that make you function optimally right so you're going to choose the foods that make you feel best most of the times which happens to be the foods that have more nutrients in them mm. so it's a big balance for sure Mm -hmm. So good. I love everything that you say and, and I could not agree more and especially that part around honoring our health, right? It doesn't honor my health to have a dozen donuts for breakfast, a dozen donuts for lunch and a dozen donuts for dinner. However, if I felt like having a donut, I can have a donut, 
right? There mm-hmm. is, it's not an all or none principle. And I think that's what you said was so incredibly important around understanding what intuitive eating is, because I don't know about you, but I see this on social media all the time. I'm an intuitive eater. And then somebody's like eating like all this junk food and promoting junk food. And then, and I'm watching them over months and they're, they're putting on it like a significant amount of weight and saying this, this is what intuitive eating is all about. And like, no, but, but also stop that because that's not what intuitive eating is about. To me, intuitive eating is those natural cues that we were born with. And I'm a mother of two, and I just remember my kids, when they were babies, when they were hungry, they would cry for food. And and then once they were full, you could not put one Mm -hmm. more drop in their mouth. It was over. It was done. They had had enough. And so to me, that's what intuitive eating is. And intuitive eating, too, is your body wanting the things that knows it serves, that serves it. And so I know my body knows that I need certain vitamins and minerals and certain cofactors in order to make hormones and in order to really make enzymes. And so when your body knows that, that's actually what it'll call for. But then yes, we do for the sure. Restriction, which is what you said earlier. So I'm not going to eat this because my goal is to lose weight. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to have this because I want to change my body. And the focus is really on that outcome, which is to be in a smaller body or to lose weight. Then everything becomes this reward system that we set up in the brain. I can't have this. And so by denying myself and really wanting it and going against the desire of wanting it is what creates that reward system. And so I think that's so important to talk about today. And I'm just curious in your practice and in your experience, have you come across that place where you needed to explain a little bit deeper what intuitive eating really is and that it's not just this eat whatever you want whenever you want and however you want and not really honoring your health oh yes all of the time and i use that exact same explanation so i was smiling about the mm-hmm. kind of we're born intuitive eaters right mm-hmm. so we are and to an, to an extent we're born intuitive eaters like you said we cry when we're hungry we you know we stop when we're full we, we know our needs but when we grow up it obviously gets a lot more complicated right we have all these messages from diet culture telling us what's right what's wrong yeah. so intuitive eating yes we're born with it to an extent but i feel like it's also evolved and we have all of these different principles right so we are rejecting the diet mentality we're honoring our hunger and honoring our fullness we're also making sure we ha- we're satisfied we're respecting our bodies we're honoring our health we're bringing that nutrition component into it so there's so many moving parts and even anytime i try to explain intuitive eating i find it really difficult because like for me even when i was learning about intuitive eating i you know i had read the book i had done all these things and someone would be like what's intuitive eating i'm like i i don't know like i can't explain <laughs> it because there's just so much to it there's not just one little simple definition right there's just so many moving parts and it really can look different for so many people too right right yeah and and there's this this documentary that comes to mind as you were just sharing and i don't want to drop any names of documentaries but it's actually one that i would recommend everyone to watch and i think it's called that sugar film and i think it's on prime if it's still there and what's so interesting about this documentary if anybody wants to watch it i'm not going to blow the ending for you by the way but just to let you know that this is this is along the lines of what we're talking about today and so you have this person who is for i think a span of a couple of months going to keep the same number of calories that he eats so he doesn't change the number of calories instead he changes the quality of what he eats and and specifically he goes from eating natural foods so foods that are plant-based and and meat-based and all these things so natural foods food that really come come from nature come from our environment directly nothing processed so he goes from that to eating health foods Okay. Now, health foods marketed as health foods, which means he juices and he goes for smoothies and then he buys the kombucha and then he buys like all these products that are so healthy for us because the label said it was so healthy and part of a whole food diet and so on and so forth. And so he's he's sticking to the same number of calories every single day, only changing what he's eating and specifically selecting the foods that are marketed to us as healthy. And of course... I'm not going to blow the ending, but you can imagine his body changed. And more importantly than what his body changed, his blood results changed. And now he started to increase risk factors of certain diseases. And this kind of comes back to your point around honoring your health and why sometimes it's important to bring in that nutrition component. Because again, we don't know what we don't know. If I went to the grocery store, I went to my health food store, and there's all these products that are processed, but the person said they were so healthy for me and that's what i chose for for myself i should at least know what the impact is on my body and that is again our sense of responsibility to to really learn that for sure yeah i think yeah we're definitely those companies just um those they those companies try and portray these health foods as like 
being what we need, right? When it's not at all what we need. And people, like I've seen people complaining of like, for example, gut issues when they've taken a lot of these health foods. And like the solution was to add another one to help. Right. But it's like, no, let's just eat food and not worry about adding in all of these supplements that are probably contributing to your problem. Yeah, oh, so good. And, and, I, and I definitely have some beliefs around those and especially just when we think about our food and really the food that we consume and how it's actually not food but it's food-like substances that we're consuming all the time because they are man-made, they were manufactured somehow, and we're told that that's what we should choose. And so again, mm -hmm. coming back to intuitive eating, if I was stuck on a desert island, like what would be accessible to me? Or if I rewound 100 years and then looked at what my grand-grandparents were eating, well, mm -hmm that was real food and so a lot has changed and again it's it's a little bit it's a little bit frustrating especially for people like us who are always talking about intuitive eating it's it's frustrating for us because there's still this stream that we do have to swim against and we have to just bring in that element of education and you know Krista I just launched an app it's right now in its final phases it's it's in the app store actually on Google Play and it's called Hitdex and when you do start the app, it actually does start to ask you a little bit around what your goals are. And there is this nutrition component. And the reason why I added this nutrition component, even though I am an intuitive eater and I'm, I am anti-diet, is because, again, we don't know what we don't know. If I have absolutely no idea that this food doesn't serve me, or if I have a particular condition, because let's say for the ketogenic diet, it does have its place and it does have its merit when it depends when it comes to certain diseases, for example. If I understand this and I can start to really take a, a, a big look at what it is that I'm consuming without the goal of restriction, without the goal of dieting, but just to really start to get a sense of, hmm, I ate this, does, I, does that feel good for me? right mm -hmm. really starting to attach feeling with action then we have all of our answers and that will be different for everybody because we're very very individual for sure and like that's why i like to go back to the feel good thing because like you said before i'm not going to eat 12 donuts but one donut's going to feel okay and like going back to the point of you saying like thinking of years ago the food that was available and over time yes we we have a lot more processed foods and stuff um processing to an extent is obviously for the better right in terms of preserving and all that stuff um but the fact is that now we have all these more highly processed foods i guess so there's still a place for them because that's just part of it that's just part of our lives now right like you're going to be at work and people are going to bring in those more processed foods or you're going to be at a potluck and those more processed foods are going to be available and it doesn't mean you have to avoid them again it's do the things that make you feel good you know that eating a bunch of that stuff isn't going to feel good but you know if you focus on the things that normally make you feel good and have a little bit of that on the side you get the satisfaction you still feel fine you're not ruining your health yeah, absolutely. So good. So good. So coming to back to that time in your life where you felt out of control around food, where you were experiencing binge episodes. First, I find that super fascinating because to your point from the outside, it wasn't even about needing to release weight. It had nothing to do with that. And this just shows any disordered eating. This just shows that it is an issue with the nervous system. It's an issue with the brain versus an issue with discipline or motivation. It's not a motivation issue in any way, but really is that we actually trigger this part of us, this reptilian part of the brain that desires that we create a reward system around that and mm -hmm. so how did you heal yourself from that place because a lot of people maybe listening are like okay I've been dieting my whole life that's the only reason that I've been in control of my weight and now you're telling me that I should trust myself because I don't trust myself I've never yeah. trusted myself when it comes to food so now you're telling me that, that this is in me I don't know I don't know the messages I could never pick up on those messages there's no way that I can follow what would you what would you say to a person based on your experience of healing around that particular part of just starting your journey with faith and with love and with absolute just knowing and certainty that you will get into this place where your body will start to choose in a way that serves you. I think it's really hard to go from like relying on diets to trust your body. Um, so one thing, if it is a struggle, definitely get support. Personally, I've said this before too. I wasn't someone that when I stopped dieting, I put on a bunch of weight and some people will. Um, it really depends on the severity of the diet, what your natural set point weight range is. There's a lot of factors that come into play. And when you go from dieting, um, you, you never really, to intuitive eating, you never really know which way your weight will go. Like it could go up, it could go down, it could be maintained 
gained. Some people have to gain before they go back down to their set weight. It can go anyway. And I think for the people that put on weight, it's going to be extremely hard. So definitely get support. But I think you just need to trust the process because you have to give your body and like your metabolism time to um, adapt because mm -hmm. through dieting, you've probably damaged your metabolism. So it wouldn't really be that surprising depending on the diet if you do gain weight initially. Mm -hmm. um, so just trusting the process doing the things that feel good to your body, doing the things that you actually know are honoring your health um, and really working on that body acceptance piece is, is huge because that's the reason we diet, right? It's because we don't accept our bodies. We don't like our bodies. We want to be smaller. So working on body acceptance, working on your body image while healing all these things is um, super important on the journey. Yeah, so good. So good. And and to your point and, and my experience, especially with, with some individuals is, there is this rebound weight gain that sort of happens in the beginning because suddenly like there's nothing off limits anymore. I can eat whatever I want. And oftentimes we're not connected yet with how much is enough. And it's as if the floodgates have opened, but we do regulate. And at one point, again, the body will start stop, stop wanting all of those things that we made absolutely uh, impossible for us, that we made completely off limits for us. At one point, the body will stop to crave these things. And then we'll start to adapt to having normal portions. So this is a very temporary phase. And I want to say this to anyone who's afraid to give this a try. Just know that it may happen. And this is a possibility. But there is this regulation that happens because your body will never allow you, never allow you through a loving energy to eat 12 donuts a day like we brought up earlier and mm -hmm. 12 donuts for lunch and 12 donuts for dinner. Your body will not feel well. It will actually crave other things. And so we do have this impact that diet creates on the metabolism where it starts to slow down the metabolism because the body is in fight or flight. It's actually holding on to stored energy for a long amount of time. But the moment we actually shift into a place of calm and we come to parasympathetic nervous state where our body starts to feel safe, we actually do start to regulate. So this whole concept around permanently damaged metabolism, it's very temporary. And the body is so adaptive. It's so incredible at healing when you give it the opportunity. And by feeling more frustrated and guilty and ashamed of even putting on a few pounds because now we're moving towards intuitive eating only tends to propagate this feeling more, this, this feeling of out of control more, and then also start again to reward, create that reward system in the brain. And so I would say for anyone listening who's afraid to try this, just have faith. It is a process. And before we start anything, I always say to look at success stories because success leaves clues. And I can get proof that this works by hearing other people's success stories, especially if I heard that they did initially put on a few pounds, but then it regulated and then they ended up releasing all the weight that they were struggling with almost their entire life. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, like that's a thing too. And some people are just naturally in larger bodies. So that's another weight yeah. uh, thing to consider too, that we don't all have, we're not all going to be naturally thin. And yes, there's a lot of pressures. And I understand being in a larger body is very difficult for many reasons because of the stigma and all those things. Um, and the other thing to consider with this too is our bodies aren't like our bodies want to be at whatever their healthy weight is, right? So once you're doing the things it wants, your body's going to settle there. It's not looking for reasons to lose a bunch of weight or put on a bunch of weight, right? Unless you have a health condition, like we were talking about cancer and stuff like that, right? But our bodies want to stay at a place that's healthy for them. So if you're giving it what it needs, it's going to stay there. Mm, so good. Thank you for adding that. So incredibly important. And, and that's the thing is, I think that word acceptance is really, really that first stage of healing is absolutely accepting that it's okay it's okay to be diverse it's okay to be different it's okay to have a different body and there's not this one ideal image which by the way is photoshopped and when mm -hmm. we understand that most photos on instagram have some sort of filter and that you can actually now modify any photo i mean this should already start to to bring us more clues as to how unreal or unrealistic that objective that we've always had is and so to your point health is not a size health is how you feel and that's mm -hmm. what needs to change is that it's not a weight on the, on the scale. It's not a weight range. It's not a BMI. It's not a clothing size. It's how you feel. Because I know people who are very underweight or who are at normal weight and are not healthy for other reasons. Oh, 100%. And I know people who are heavier than me and who are in larger bodies and can outrun me, can out pull up me, can out do any like out fitness me in every way. And so it's so clear that it's it's not in any way associated with weight. And so this is so incredibly important. And and it really is almost in some ways very, very relieving. I find like what a sense of relief to actually hear this, to to actually make it OK, 
to forgive mm-hmm. myself, to forgive myself for always wanting to restrict, to always wanting something almost impossible for myself. For How sure. How do you feel about that, Krista? Go ahead. Yeah, and I've had like um, patients, for example, and when I, um, because like I said, I was a clinical dietitian, I still actually contract myself to the hospital, so I still work in clinical dietetics as well. Um, and when I get referred to a patient, um, sometimes referrals from doctors will be like weight loss or obese or whatever, use those times kind of terms, or if it's actually for some kind of legit reason. <laughs> Either way, when I walk in and I say I'm the dietitian, I think people get like oh, like standoffish and they think I'm going to start talking about their weight and telling them to lose weight. And obviously I take the conversation a completely different direction. And I've had patients just being so thankful for that. Like, wow, no one's ever told me this. I'm only ever told that my body's a problem. I need to lose weight. Like just so appreciative of it. And I think it just really helps them. And like, I bring it back to focus. I'm like, you know what? Like we, there's no reason to focus on that. Let's focus on the reason why you're here. And the reason you're here is not because of your weight. The reason you're here is because of you have heart failure or whatever it is. Right. So what, what diet, how can we um, change, modify what you're doing right now to contribute to better health and improve the conditions that got you here in the first place? Mm, that's a way more empowering question, absolutely. And and it almost it almost suggests sustainability, right? What can we do? What can we do? And versus you have to do this if you want to do that, and there is no mm-hmm. other choice. Yes. But what can we do? What is realistic for me, and what is sustainable for me, and most importantly, what's enjoyable for me? Because if I decide to implement something that's not fun, like if I hate running and I force myself to run every day because I need to lose ten pounds by my sister's wedding or something like that. That's not fun. There's nothing fun about that. It's a punishment all the way through it. And then what happens when I do finally cross that finish line and I do release the 10 pounds and then I do go to my sister's wedding, I end up going back and even more because it wasn't something that fit with me. And so alignment is so incredibly Mm. important when we're looking at what changes can I make around my nutrition? I've made this change. How does that make me feel? And then what changes can I make around my training or around my movement? And how does that make me feel? And then also look outside that. It's not just about how much we eat and how much we move. Well, who am I spending time with that makes me so incredibly stressed? What about my job that also makes me incredibly stressed? Because we're forgetting to mention that diet is all of those things. Diet is everything that we consume. It's the news, the social media, everything that, that goes inside our physical body that changes us, that makes us feel that we are not okay, that we are not safe. And so when we understand this, we can now start to control a lot of the different factors in our environment and understand that health is this all encompassing thing and it's not just what we're eating how much we weigh and what our bmi is saying exactly yes there's so many more components to health and even with like the fitness side of thing like you said like if you're forcing yourself to do something you don't want to do every day it's not going to be sustainable you're never going to do it so in terms of movement looking at things like that you enjoy and that make you feel good and like for example i run um do i love running no but i don't dislike it i love how it makes me feel i don't want to go for a run every time i choose to but i know how much better i'm going to feel and that's what keeps me going right Mm -hmm. if your focus is weight loss well you're not going to lose 10 pounds after one run so it's a lot easier easier to be like, no, I'm just not going to do it. But when you're focusing on doing things that feel good to your body, you're going to continue to do them over and over and over again. So good. And then you'll take on new challenges. So it might start with, all right, I'm just going to start with walking. I'm going to start walking 5,000 steps a day. Suddenly that becomes 10,000 steps because the 5,000 now feels good. I've mastered it. Now it's 10,000 steps. I'm going to start running. I'm going to start running just a couple kilometers at a time because now that feels good. And then all of a sudden I'm going to sign up for a half marathon. And that is the journey. The journey mm-hmm. is not overnight and it's really over time. And it's about you constantly being in your own integrity, which is I feel and I think in alignment in a way where it is aligned for me because I'm not I'm not feeling terrible about this run. It's not that I hate it this whole time because my thoughts are around releasing weight and this is really more no more than a punishment for me. But instead, this feels good. I'm honoring my body. I love how it makes me feel. And it's definitely something that I can keep up. For sure. And with dieting, it's more of like that all or nothing mentality, right? Where you're like going all in and you're cutting out everything and you're going to start working out six days a week, going from zero to six days a week. It's not sustainable. Like you said, you build up, you start running two kilometers, it feels good, you go more. That's the way it, that's the way it needs to be. Yeah, absolutely. So good. It's so, so fresh and amazing and beautiful to connect with somebody who's so like-minded and and just to know that more and more of us are out there really talking about the importance of really releasing diet mindset and really understanding that it actually makes no sense especially from an evolutionary standpoint that dieting really doesn't make sense and all of these rules around what's good for us and what's bad for us and what we're meant to not meant to eat also when we just take that step back and just 
just really learn and just understand the way that we've evolved, it absolutely does not fit. And so it's wonderful to know that many of us are doing this work, Krista. And so along those lines, as we conclude our conversation today, was there anything else that you wanted to share that you didn't have a chance to yet? I guess just even in line with that too, like about all the dieting things that we know to be true. Like if you actually look at the research and the research that shows like this diet worked and this is how it worked. If you actually really critically analyze that paper, you're going to find a lot of things that are wrong with it. Um, and the person who is, and a research is very biased, right? The person who's doing the research knows how they want to show the results. They're not going to show the results that they didn't want to happen. So just also thinking of it that way, because there is a research paper to prove anything you basically want out there. Absolutely. It's how you choose to interpret interpret it. Um, and then other than that, just I guess if you're cons if you are someone who is dieting, and you have, you know, been following Sherry for a while and considering making the switch to intuitive eating, do it. <laughs> if you don't know where to start, get support. It's literally a life changing transformation. And yeah, like for me personally, that that's why I do it now, because I know how much better life is when you make the switch from dieting to intuitive eating, my quality of life has um, improved so much. Oh, I love that so much. I love that so much. And, and it is it is really the, the time in my life that I felt the most healthy, I have to say, Krista. And it's my body hasn't changed. Nothing has changed. I feel better. I'm not fixated and focused on, on what I'm eating and where I'm going and what food will be available for me. It's so liberating. So I can yes. think about all these other things and I'm, and I'm able to create other things in my life because I'm not so focused on food and what I'm going to eat and what I'll avoid. And so that's so beautiful. That really hits home for me. And I resonate with everything that you said so much. And I have had such an amazing conversation with you. And I love everything that you said. It's just so, so powerful. So, so needed. So if somebody wanted to reach out to you to connect with you, to learn more from you, where can they go to do that? Um, I'm mostly on Instagram. So definitely find me there. You can find me at dietitian.krista. So uh, my professional title dot my name, Krista. Um, I also have a website, I could send it the link to Sherry to link in the show notes, but definitely send me a message there. I share a lot of information like we talked about today. I talk about dieting, I talk about intuitive eating. Um, and I know that conversations like this that we just had generate a lot of questions. So if you have questions about anything, please reach out, let me know you listen to this episode. I'd love to hear from you. Amazing, Krista. I love that. Thank you so much. And we will definitely add that in the show notes. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me.